This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Welcome in everybody to this week's edition of Doc and Jock. So much going on in the world of Detroit sports. We are here today to break it all down. I am the Doc, John McEnroe. Joining me, my guy, Adam, the Jock Strozinski. Today, we're going to break down episode one of Hard Knocks. It has debuted nationally. The world got to see what we get to look at every single day regarding Dan Campbell. I want to get Adam's reaction to what we saw the storylines, what's kind of being played out nationally now regarding the reaction to the feature documentary about our Detroit Lions. And we're going to look at kind of the offense that has now emerged with DJ Chark and Amandra St. Brown and Jamison Williams. Interesting news made on Wednesday regarding his jersey. And then we'll finish out the podcast just looking at something real interesting that happened in Detroit in regards to Little Caesars Arena, District Detroit, maybe you've heard about it, maybe you haven't, but real interesting, maybe suspicious news that came out real quickly here regarding uh, property near Little Caesars Arena. Because I was surprised, I actually thought, before you had messaged me, I really thought you were going to take it in on Wednesday morning, and you, you did it, you stayed up, you watched it live Tuesday, I give you credit, it was awesome. Had an opportunity to check it out. I thought that, you know, the anticipation was just palpable. Everybody was looking at it. I thought the clips, some people said, well, it's maybe a little bit too much uh, pre-releasing of some preview clips. I thought it made it perfect because the the show itself expanded upon the clips we saw at Dan Campbell and Jamal Williams. I loved it. The only complaint really that I would have is you only had the first episode be 46 minutes long out of an hour time slot that you're allotted, how do you not come up with 14 additional minutes that you could have sprinkled throughout that broadcast with the coaches, Dan Campbell, maybe one more storyline with the player? 46 minutes? The director cut us short. What the heck? That's really my only complaint. We're going to talk about the topics here briefly, but I can't believe that the show was 46 minutes. I wanted more. Yeah, I thought it was kind of... I don't want to say unfair, but it, it, it did leave you wanting more. But when you wrap up on Deuce Staley in, in, a, in a coaching room talking about guys passing gas, <laughs> I mean, what, what, what are we really doing here? You couldn't find another couple of minutes to fill in, give us something of substance. This is what I'll say about the very first episode. I thought it was, I thought it was good. I thought it was entertaining. I don't think we really got anything of substance from this. I think if you are if you're not familiar with with the Detroit Lions, you're not familiar with Dan Campbell, if you're not familiar with this coaching staff, I think you got a little bit of a of a look inward and you got to see a guy with a huge personality in Dan Campbell, a guy who who basically tells it how it is. He's a, he's a straight shooter, he's no BS. It is what it is. Either you like him, you love him, or you hate him. There really isn't a middle ground with him. It, you you, you kind of fall on one one side of the aisle or the other. As far as the other coaches go, I think you got you kind of got brought into what you get with Aaron Glenn. Um, I thought he came off as as a very genuine, uh, pretty humble guy, a guy who who is extremely motivated and knows what he wants his defense to look like. I think with Deuce Staley, you got brought into a guy who is in your face, tells you what it is and how it's going to be, and basically motivates you and pushes you to get every ounce out of you. I think that was great. I think getting introduced to these coaches was fantastic. There was really no introduction to any players. You got a little bit with Aiden Hutchinson, but that was really about it. Like it it is so weird because we've watched hard knocks before we watched, we watched almost all of the hard knocks and we love it. We love the series. But it kind of tells you what is on this roster. There's no superstars on this roster. The coaching staff, those those are your superstars. There is not one superstar on this roster for these cameras to follow around and build their programming around. And I think that is kind of where that extra 15 minutes fell off. And and look, 
I was pretty disappointed that it ended at 45 minutes. I like I, at, at 41 minutes, I ended up sending you a text message and I was like, all right, cool. So we still have roughly almost 20 minutes left in the show. This is awesome. And then next thing you know, they're showing a, a, a picture of DeAndre Hopkins standing on a box. And I was like, what the hell is this? And then they're previewing something for like sumo wrestling. And I'm like, what the hell is this? And then next thing you know, I'm like, huh, that was over pretty quick. That's 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 unusual. It got it, short it, change. Not normal. Yeah, yeah it felt for like, sure. It felt for like sure. because we've watched it and they've all been 55 minutes. Now, there are storylines. You did see some interviews that you started to see. All the players are sitting down. You know you're going to get Jared Goff. You know you might get a deeper story of Jamal Williams. Most likely the rookie will be uh, Malcolm Rodriguez in regards to – the development that he has. Now, I'll, I'll tell you this real quick. So when they were going through and they are talking about what training camp means to them and what basically wearing pads means to them, Malcolm Rodriguez came across as the guy, as the guy. Because when they asked and they said, well, what was it? What does training camp mean to you? Everybody's talking about how it's, a, how it's brutal, how it's this, how it's that. He's like, I get to hit people. <laughs> you love to hear that. You love that. That's what you want to hear. This is a guy who... If his talent is there, he's going to be embraced by this fan base. If he has the ability to get on the field and play meaningful downs, this town is going to absolutely love this guy. He seems very charismatic, and the fact that he's like, I get to hit people. That is great. That is great. People are going to fall in love with that man. Yes. Sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, absolutely. I think that he is very personable, big smile, always approachable. So early on, he's doing everything that you would think you need to make a fan base really like you. He hits people, he's personable, and now I will give him a demerit for whatever that was that he was trying to do for his performance. Oh, you didn't like his salsa dancing? Uh, salsa dancing for <laughs> dudes. Uh, look, because here's it, the great context was, it might have happened that day when I spoke to him or a couple of days later. But I had had a chance after after it got leaked out that Aiden was doing Billy Jean. I walked up to him and I just said, "Hey, you know what's the scoop?" And he's like, "I haven't prepared yet, haven't done anything." And I'm like, "Well, obviously you got to take your time and you got to beat Aiden." And he's like, "Yeah, he didn't kind of have he didn't give me that day the the confidence that he was going to try and go do that." Now I get it. You you obviously saw Aiden rile up everybody. And a linebacker singing might not be the portrayal that you want. But I was okay. But juxtapose that with Aiden, who brought the house down. We're going to talk about that. But in regards to the developing personalities, I think there's going to be one more story that we got to find. And I'm not sure who is it going to be. Is it going to be James Houston, Chase Lucas? One of the draftees or an undrafted free agent, maybe Pimpleton or somebody else, Demetrius Taylor, a player who is going to be looking at an uphill climb for a roster spot. So that should come into fruition next week, who that's going to be, because roster cuts take place. So that's the next part I want to see is now we, we've gotten Dan Campbell. We've gotten the introduction to the coaching staff. Now you want to see a little bit more of what happens in the meeting rooms, how the coaches talk to the players, how Campbell will address the first round of cuts. And that should start, uh, maybe not the next episode, it'll start potentially. Well, maybe pay attention because episode two is Tuesday. The five cuts are due on Tuesday as well from 90 to 85. So we'll see if that happens maybe Sunday or Monday and they get it out of the way because a lot of the post-production work is done Tuesday morning before the final show airs. But I just loved hearing Liv Schreiber narrate the Detroit Lions. He's such a pro. It was great to see everything going on. The speech that Dan Campbell and Jamal Williams gave was awesome. Now, when we get to Aiden Hutchinson, kind of like Michigan, it kind of felt like a lot of hype. So there was like butter. Everybody was like, oh, it was great. Now, here's why I think this is kind of symbolic of this team. Aiden botched the song. He started with the false start. Like the nerves got to him. And of course, when you're up there and you got to tell everybody about yourself and you got to perform in front of everybody and you know that you're being asked to do this because you're Aiden Hutchinson and this is going to be broadcast, he botched it. Now, the way in which it was hyped up, best ever, this is great, it lent to the thing that you would kind of assume would be the singing and the dancing. Now, he had some moves, he, he had a little rhythm, but Aiden can't sing. 
And it was not that quality of a performance in my mind. Now, what made it special was the theme that you're going to now see with this. It's a team. The team picked him up. Once he got into it, once they were bored with his voice, they were like, oh, we don't want to hear this. We want to jump in. And collectively, it made for a moment. But I'll say this. Aiden Hutchinson's performance on its own, I don't think it deserved all the hype that it got. It was cool collectively now with the crowd. C minus. It, it, it was a C minus performance. C minus for him, but A plus when you see the team rally and right. getting hyped and getting and that's that moment. That's what made that special. That's, that's what made that what it was, was the fact that everybody, offense, defense, you even had some of the coaches in the background nodding along with it, but you had these guys riled up in their chairs. Some of these guys were standing on their chairs with their arms swinging back and forth. That's what made it special. Yes, so I think that everyone was saying maybe how they felt in that they all got into it. Yeah, but um, typically speaking, the performances that we've seen, I would have actually liked if Aiden had a pair for being the number two. You go up there and you deliver a speech like Dan Campbell would. You just go up there and read Dan Campbell's intro speech. Go up there, get a podium, and just go out there and do it the same way in a more ferocious way. Or maybe you have a little background music or a little something, a little NWO music, a little Hulk Hogan music, a little Ric Flair, something of pizzazz to imitate because I think the one that most people commented on our Twitter page at Detroit Podcast was Ray Lewis imitating Shannon Sharp back in the Baltimore Ravens uh, episode of Hard Knocks. But uh, that was fun to see. It went viral. And luckily, you know, it was kind of leaked a little bit that it was going to happen on Tuesday, his 22nd birthday. We had that at All Lions over the weekend, so everybody got hyped to see it, and they saw it. And eventually speaking, you're right. It is kind of weird that they didn't maybe go with Goff as well to kind of introduce that story a little bit. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're going to do that as well in the future episodes. But there was still more, too. You could have actually took 10 minutes to just kind of tell the background after segment one with with the speech. You just talk about kind of maybe... A little bit of the struggles of the team the com- coming where they are. A little bit of, of 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 commentary in regards to how we got to where we are with the organization. But I'll say this to wrap up Hutchinson. That media member who asked about that video clip was spectacular. <laughs> I, I thought, was waiting for it. <laughs> I, was, I was really impressed by that question because it was the only media question that was featured. And really to sum it up, that was me. That was great. I saw that, and wait a minute, because me and my wife froze for a second. I'm like, whoa, that's my question. And I had no idea at that time. Obviously, it was just I saw that hit uh, live and in person, and it was great. So my thinking was, okay, this is all puff pieces, and and, and, and tell me about this player, and tell me about that player, and what's this, what's that. I'm like, I want to see what Dan's thinking about Aiden getting flattened by TJ Hawkinson. So I asked that question just to see what it was, and, and Dan gave a great answer in regards to moving on and moving forward. And a couple media members took that later on in the pressers to kind of talk about his growth and things like that. And I like, I thought it was fair. I thought it was a fair question and a fair answer, but uh, it, it, it was great because you don't see me, you just hear my voice. And from where we are as voices in, in, in a podcast medium, it, it like I said, another culmination of the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Forever immortalized, you and I cause... Detroit Sports Podcast, immortalized in hard knocks. And, of course, I've watched it now 50,000 times. Not the part for my question. The video Debatable. piece. No, the part where Hutchinson uh, gets flattened by uh, TJ Hawkinson. He runs off. He's like, you fucker. And then the next part is me asking his head coach about getting flattened from a guy who went to Michigan State. It really... Is funny on a lot of levels, but uh, I enjoyed it, and now there'll be more opportunities to see if 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 they get to me. I'm not trying to do that. Obviously, I know where the cameras are. I try to stand off to the side. I intentionally am not doing that. Um, I would rather avoid that. Um, but in the end, that was awesome. In that, a media question was portrayed about the number two pick, and a football question aired. So I thought that was. That was spectacular, and uh, I, like I said, I, I'm excited for it. I think that the hype that everybody gets to see, I think, is um, good, too, in that it's going to be at least the league seeing positivity with the Lions, and that's all people want is to show the Lions in a, in a light that's a little bit different. Is there a storyline that obviously we haven't talked about that you would want to see maybe flushed out? Uh, Brad Holmes maybe in his relationship. I see because you got to remember, too, the team has influence, guys. 
NFL Films will put out the product, the team reviews it, and will take out any football-related content and will not allow like any specifics in regards to scheme or stuff that makes the players look a little off. Maybe Jeff Okuda, but I was gonna say, oh, you think the team has influence? Yeah. Because that 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 the first episode came off as a complete puff piece. Yeah, yeah, of course. Like, like if, if if somebody was writing that or or producing it that wasn't HBO and didn't have a <laughs> deal with the NFL, you would be like, what are you giving me? This is like spoon fed sugar. This is like straight from the Kremlin. What are we? Right. What, what's going on here? But boy, are people but, eating it up, bro. They're eating it up. They're like, yeah, they're it, loving it. Total, total puff piece. Oh yeah, McAfee. Uh, the the hard hitters are like, oh, we love Dan Campbell. Not too much negativity, so I'll take we'll take it, man. It's fun. It's a football show, but that's uh, that's so where he, they go. Here's here's the deal, though. Like I think Dan, as far as Dan Campbell goes, absolutely. Like that is Dan Campbell. Dan Campbell is a guy who gets you motivated to run through walls. He's a guy who gets you up and gets you going. He's a guy who you can tell he legitimately cares about his players and he wants this team to succeed at all levels. Whether it's because of him, whether it's because of their own talent, whether it's because of whatever the grace of God. This is a guy who who believes in these guys. I mean, look at it last year. Look at last year. They took a chance on a lot of guys, a lot of one-year contract guys, guys who were who were looking to either make a name for themselves or guys who were who were looking to, to basically demonstrate their ability at, at at being a starter or just having more reps, more meaningful reps. They took a chance on a lot of those guys. Dan Campbell cares about all of those guys. Dan Campbell is extremely extremely motivational and Dan Campbell is a guy who like I said tells it how it is so of course a guy like Pat McAfee is going to love it of course a yeah. lot of the the general public who's not necessarily exposed to Dan Campbell is going to love it he's a likable guy he's incredibly charismatic and incredibly gregarious I mean you go back to his very first his very first press conference it, it, it starts talking about biting kneecaps off and it starts talking about dropping elbows and he got a little carried away huh. and he's willing to admit that I think. And you, you go back to a press conference he did last year where he was wearing a helmet for the MI uh, speedway uh, race. You know what I'm saying? So uh, this is a guy who he's just uh, exudes personality. So that totally makes sense. But to take this back to kind of the, the, the question you had lobbed out there, is there a storyline I would like to see developed a little bit more? I would love to see that relationship with Brad Holmes, uh, Dan Campbell. I would love to see that that delved into a little bit more. I'd like to see them on the sideline as training camp is unfolding and them talking about players, them talking about what they need, what it is that they're looking to do, what they're trying to accomplish. Because every time you hear both of these guys talk and they talk about each other, it's it's all roses. It's all rainbows. It's everything is good. It's we're, we're working together. We're doing this. We're doing that. It's kind of hard to to necessarily believe that because Dan Campbell has his plate full with getting this team ready and prepared, and you've got Brad Holmes, whose job is to basically help go buy more groceries so Dan Campbell can cook the dish. So it, how are they actually working together? Seeing them working together, I think, would be incredibly interesting. I also want to see Jared Goff, and I want to see his relationship with these players. What I found extremely interesting in this whole entire first episode Jared Goff was basically mute through this entire thing. There were some there were some pictures and some shots of Jared Goff taking notes, but you seen Jamal Williams, who looks like an absolute freaking leader on this offense. You seen Jamal Williams getting these guys hyped. You saw Jamal Williams get into the defense's face. You saw Jamal Williams all over the place. Talk about personality. Jamal Williams has some personality. He's a guy who who really showed up in this first episode. Where's your quarterback? Isn't he supposed to be the leader of this offense? Where is he? You see nothing. You hear nothing. He, he basically looks like he is brand new to this team. Like he's the rookie on this team. Got his tablet. Got a pen. He's taking notes, jotting stuff down. He looks almost like a deer in headlights. Why does your quarterback look like that? That's my big concern. Why does your quarterback look like that? Your quarterback should be the guy who's rallying everybody up. I want to see if Jared Goff in the next couple episodes takes that step forward and how they portray, portray Jared Goff because – he looked like he was basically mute, and he looked like he was brand new to this team. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see how moving forward. I think that how how, how the lines are gonna be portrayed. I think maybe one other thing I'd like to see maybe an interview with Sheila, five minutes. Just hey, it's been tough. Maybe you kind of address what happened with Calvin Johnson publicly, and you just say, hey, look, it's my job to turn things around. 
It's an organization I take seriously. You put yourself out there one more time, and uh, hey, you can even put out there uh, as part of the five to ten minutes that you allot to her. I'm a female owner, and I want to make sure that this city gets what it deserves. Just put out there, hey, that this is something that's serious. I'm serious about. I'm, I've been at training camp practice every single day. Maybe make Sheila a little bit more of a sympathetic figure because she still gets lumped in with her whole entire family, and she's only been at the helm for one or two years officially. Now, she's been there, and you still have to take accountability for how Calvin Johnson's been treated and how a couple of missteps in regards to the decision to keep Matt Patricia one more year when you should have really just lobbed him off. It could have really set forth the organization in a whole different path. You could have had Justin Herbert. You could have drafted it for the future instead of being behind the eight ball one or two extra years. But now this Friday, cuz, is the preseason opener. So tomorrow, on Friday, Atlanta Falcons, the starters are going to play one quarter. What do you want to see? I think... Based on what they've said, and I think they're gonna, they've said it out publicly. They just want to make sure they line up properly, no false starts, get the procedures done, and then the next step is to execute and try to really put some good film on tape. I don't think you're gonna read too much into it. You're gonna get a lot of understanding more about the second and third stringers than you are gonna get about golf and. Because you're going to see us some handoffs, some screens. You're not. Remember, guys, preseason is vanilla. You don't unload your playbook. You might see one intermediate crossing pattern. You might see something. I don't expect to see DJ Shark, who we're going to talk about in a minute here. I don't expect him to be lighting it up all over the place. I just expect proficient, maybe one or two drives from the offense where you get a couple first downs. The most important number one mission over the next month is everybody stays healthy to give the team an opportunity to defeat the Philadelphia Eagles. That's it. So if Goff can walk away unscathed, every member of the offensive line, all the key players on offense, the other thing I want to see is Akuda. How does he look? How does he look coming in and out of his breaks? What is going on in regards to his recognition of some of the routes that the Atlanta Falcons receivers are going to put out there? That's what I want to see, and it'll be fun on a Friday, 6 o'clock, is when the preseason opener takes place from Ford Field. I have a question for you. Do you think that Jeff Okuda plays, look, this is first preseason game, do you think Jeff Okuda gets about 60% of the reps in this game? This is, uh, this is a guy who, who last week, the, the noise coming out of Allen Park was Jeff Okuda just needs reps. Jeff Okuda needs lots of reps because this is a dude who, who hasn't played a whole bunch this season. Do we think that Jeff Okuda plays more than 50% of the snaps? No. I said 60. No, I, I think he gets the first quarter as well. Um, I, I, you, Look, it's his first game back. You don't want to risk it with that guy. You might even just put him in for a series just to make sure that he gets his bearings around him and that he's confident. Because, l- look, here's the other double-edged sword. The risk for him is twofold. One... He re-injures himself, which is a huge nightmare. Two, if he goes out there and he sucks, that might even be worse than actually getting hurt again because there is already this perception that he's not a good defensive back. If he goes out there and just gets taken advantage of, if a rookie, if that's the first star for Desmond Ritter, if he's out there and Ritter just torches him on a, on a move and, and, and looks him off and uses a shoulder fake to you know, take him out of a play, that could be so devastating because even though he makes good plays at training camp, the the two or three times he gets beat, the crowd in the at Allen Park groans. Come on, Jeff. You know, they 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 are they are aware fully of who they're targeting. And even when he gets beat, he's getting beat deep quite a bit. So I think to first confidence, you just need a a, a play, a pass breakup, uh, a pop, something that allows the film to look good in his favor. So that's the best thing that can happen outside of um, everybody staying healthy is for Akuda just to make a couple plays to kind of start the momentum in his favor because it's overwhelmingly right now he's a player that was not worth taking at number three. And he's got to, even though as much positivity as is out there as many people try to spin it in, in a way, well, he's doing this, he's doing that, until he goes up against live competition, until he sees live reps in person against somebody other than his own teammate, then we won't understand fully where he's at as a player. So this is, this is the first opportunity, but not 60%, no. I would say 10 snaps, 12 snaps, uh, be out there for the first quarter and see what happens, how you can do a couple series here and there. But 
I'm curious to see how the likes of Malcolm Rodriguez, James Houston, Chase Lucas, the draft picks, um, how, how they're going to shake out. But some positivity out of camp, because over the last two weeks, you have two wideouts that are going to battle to be the number one. The question is, who's the number one wide receiver on this team? Is it Amandre St. Brown or is it DJ Shark Jr.? Because right now, based on what we've seen in camp, even though ESPN recently came out and interviewed Amonra and think that he's the go-to guy, he's the, 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 the guy that when you need something, Jared Goff said, hey, when I need something, I'm looking to Amonra. I think 1-1A one and one a are Amonra St. Brown and DJ Shark. Even if you need a big play, I would say that the deep threat right now is Shark, and he's doing a great job at camp in regards to hauling in catches, making the routes look good, and uh, really making Jared Goff look a lot better. So if that can take place, I would argue having Shark on the field and being productive as that big play threat from 15 yards to 30, if he can be that guy, man, that makes Amonra look that much better. But you can see uh, it's out there. Jared said it. When there's a go-to play that they're looking for, Amonra is usually the target. So it's going to be fun. I think the addition of this talented wideout from Jacksonville might be under, might be starting to come to the to the fruition here. That maybe it was a little bit underrated in regards to even though he got a one year, ten million dollar deal. This is a player. This is a baller, and I think he's got the characteristics to be someone that maybe takes the next step forward, especially in in, in what's in essence a contract year. Yeah, I think he is probably going to be the best signing that that this front office had this off season. Yeah. I think DJ Shark is your number one wide receiver. If you look at all of the videos that came out this past weekend, uh, just inundated your social media. Every time you turned around, it was some sports outlet basically saying, hey, DJ Shark did this. DJ Shark did that. Look at this awesome catch by DJ Shark. I think if you give Jared Goff time and Jared Goff can complete the pass, DJ Shark is coming down with it, and it's going to help move the chains. It's going to help take the top off the defense. Yeah, I think you're right. It does make Amonra St. Brown look better because now you have you – have, safeties and you've got corners that have to account for DJ Shark and that opens up things underneath for Monra St. Brown. But I think when it's all said and done, DJ Shark's going to be your number one wide receiver and it's just his ability to help stretch the field, get down the field, take the top off that defense and then come away with the ball. And this is a guy who is proving to everybody he's on a one year earn it deal, right? It's a one year, $10 million deal. It's very team friendly, but this is also a guy going out there saying, Hey, I wasn't utilized properly in Jacksonville. I had a couple of injuries. Yeah, that kind of sidelined me, but I am worth the investment. I am a guy who can play in this league and at this level. You're a fool for not signing me. I think he, when it's all said and done, he is going to be your number one wide receiver. And I think he looks great so far. It's going to be really interesting to kind of see how how the uh, how the, the the snap count kind of works in whose favor, right? Because at certain points last season, Amonra St. Brown had 9, 10, 11, 12, 14 targets in games. And, you know, he was coming away with double-digit receptions in these games, just doing everything. On top of that, that doesn't even count on him touching the ball behind the line of scrimmage and running with it. So it'll be interesting to see how they utilize DJ Shark and how they integrate him into this offense and, and to see how many plays actually go his way. But I think he'll be your number one guy when it's all said and done. And I think it really I think what you're looking at here too, remember going into going into what it was, I think it was like week ten, week eleven last season, after the trade for Josh Reynolds, Josh Reynolds was your number one wide receiver. Like that was your that was your guy. That was who everybody was like. That's your number one wide receiver. No matter what Amon St. Brown was doing, the the the, the was it? I believe it's the Z receiver, the guy who can go down the field, was Josh Reynolds, the guy who was supposed to help open everything up. Now, yeah, Monra got a, a ton of touches, but Josh Reynolds was supposed to be that guy. Going into the first preseason game, he's your third wide receiver. He's your third option. Like, let that sink in. That's crazy. Right. They have totally flipped that wide receiving room around. And I think it's awesome. I think it shows what you can do in a year. So it leads me to believe that this front office, it leads me to believe that this coaching staff and it leads me to believe that the players that they got, everything is headed in the right direction. And it's not me sipping Kool-Aid. It's just me telling you what I'm seeing. Whereas last year you had, you really had no idea going into the year who your number one wide receiver was going to be. Those guys didn't even make it through the season. Fast forward and you go to like week 10 and it's a guy that you ended up picking up in a trade. And that's 
supposed to be your number one guy. He's now your third option as a wide receiver. I think that's awesome. Yeah, real fast. X receiver. Uh, receiver typically on the line of scrimmage and flexed out wide. Often a team's number one is the X. The Z is usually known as the flanker. Lines up off the line of scrimmage can move in and out of the formation. These players often um, are speed players that don't have to worry about an immediate jam. And the Y receiver has grown popular as the tight end position. So you're absolutely right in regards to the Z. And so, man, because if, if the offense can take a step forward with these wideouts being interchangeable, then you, it's, it's about pick your poison. Then you got, then when you start jamming the receivers, now you pick in part with Hawkinson and Swift and Jamal Williams. And that just makes it really tough for opposing defenses because you can't stop everything. You literally st- – you can't. And then you could pick and pop some runs in the mix there with an offensive line that's determined to take a step forward. That's why I'm not – that's why I think the offense is the most improved unit as a whole, uh, the most improved side of the football. The wide receivers, as we've talked about, are the most improved unit. The side, though, that I think is concerning because it, it lends to the question of all the praise we've given Shark, Reynolds, St. Brown, Hawkinson, Swift. What does that mean for the defense? Am I, uh, guys, Amani Arawarie – it's been okay, but he his play hasn't kind of taken that step where Aaron Glenn said, hey, I need you to be a shutdown corner. Now, I know it's tough. These receivers are, can't get jammed. You can't kind of do all the physical stuff, so it makes it look like an exhibition. But the defense, do, outside of the defensive line, the defense on the back end leaves you to be a little bit worried, so pay attention to that. I think the offense will garner, obviously, attention. But also, don't turn your eyes and don't blink. About this defense, there may be times where really bright offensive minds can pick apart pretty easily and match up the their biggest tight end against your linebacker and cause some problems. Because as much as we all love Rodriguez, Barnes, and Zaloni and Board, they're not the fastest, not the uh, most technically sound tacklers. So I, I don't think it's been – the defensive line, obviously – is the spot where you think you're going to have to have the most improvement, and that's where you're going to need it, where that can mask some of the warts you have on the back end. So if Harris, if Aiden comes in and really takes a lot of pressure off of the others, then you you have some room for improvement. But guys, let's be real. The defense is the biggest area of concern collectively. Can this defense stop anybody at critical times? And will it be allowed to be stopped? I mean, it just reeks of an of a defense where if Will Harris breathes on a receiver, he's going to get called. If Okuda even makes a play, they're going to say, oh, uh, illegal contact. You know, when Aiden gets his first couple sacks, oh, offsides. You got to make sure that collectively this thing gels because a lot's at stake. But that's the unit. I, I think that when you hear all the praise that the offense gets, I think it starts to lend to some concern about the defense. Yeah, I mean— Look, I, I do have some concerns about this defense. Yes, and yes. They're it, real. It kind of, it, it, look, and it kind of goes to 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 what you're kind of laying out there, right? Like, what what is this secondary? Has this, does the secondary take a step forward? Uh, does this does the secondary really help bolster itself? Does Amari does Amari or Awarie, Easy for me to say, right? Uh, does he lock down that number one corner position? Like going in, we all think he's the number one corner. You know, is Will Harris better than him? I don't know. Is Jeff, what's Jeff Okuda? Nobody knows. There's a lot of question marks with the secondary, right? And then you look at the the defensive line and the defensive line, you've got a rookie as, as your, your starting edge rusher, right? We're penciling Aiden Hutchinson and we're all expecting him to start day one. So you have a rookie edge rusher. What does, what does he look like at this next level? Does the game move a little too fast for him? I don't necessarily think it will, but what I can tell you is a lot of the stuff that worked when he was at Michigan, a lot of the stuff that worked on the college level isn't going to work in the NFL. It just isn't because you're going up against the best of the best every single week. So how does he integrate himself? Does this, does this defensive line apply the pressure that is needed to the quarterbacks? And, and does the secondary, when turnovers are forced or the opportunity for a turnover is forced, are they able to capitalize on that? We talked a couple weeks ago about, about, this defense and how the linebacker position is really and truly the weakness of this defense because it is just so thin. I want to know who steps up. I want to know which one of these linebackers really comes into their own, which one of these linebackers really takes a hold of that position and really helps elevate it because 
I'll be honest with you. I don't know a shit ton about Chris Board. You know, I don't. I mean, look, Alex Anzalone last year, we were frying him every single week. We didn't like what he did. We didn't like the way he played. Derek Barnes was our guy who we were super interested in last year going into the season. And it really didn't work out the way I think either one of us had hoped. Towards the end of the year, he made some strides, but it was rough to get there. I mean, this is a team that's bringing back Jared Davis, looking to add him in here for depth. That was a a former first-round draft pick that this team had. And he struggled to find the field. So what are we talking about as far as the linebacking core goes? Because I've got a ton of question marks there. There are tons of question marks on this defense all over the place. And I think we're all expecting it to take a step forward, and we're all looking for an improvement. But you have to remember that there are so many, so many spots where you're just a little bit unsure about what you're going to get. And yeah, preseason's great, and it helps you get a couple reps. It helps you work out a couple of things. But until that first week happens, maybe even that second week, you really don't know what you have as far as your defense. You don't really know what Aiden Hutchinson is going to be able to give you. You really don't know if Aleem McNeil takes that next step forward or if Charles Harris is really that dog on the outside. You don't know what you got. And that is that is very scary if you're a head coach going into going into the season because you're just like, well, what do we really have here? You know, like Michael Brockers is is an is a veteran. But are you expecting a ton of production from Michael Brockers like you yourself, John? Are you expecting a ton of production from Michael Brockers? No, I'm thinking right. veteran leadership. Just help, help these guys become pros. That's what you're expecting from him. You're not you're, you just said yourself, you're not talking about tackles. You're not talking about sacks. You're not talking about forced fumbles. You're talking about a guy coming in, helping to establish the culture. That's what you're talking about, which is great because they need it. They have zero culture here, right? I think what you've seen with, uh, with, 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 with that first week's episode of Hard Knocks is there is a culture that is building here. Michael Brockers is a part of laying that, helping lay that foundation, but you're not expecting uh, any type of production. And that guy is penciled in as a starting defensive lineman for this team. And that's kind of where, where I'm at with it, right? You've got a bunch of question marks all over the place on the defensive side of the ball. Not really sure what you're going to get from a lot of these guys. And you need to see a lot of improvement from a few of these cats, like Amar, Amani Orwarie. you got to see him take that next step up. So it, it's going to be interesting to kind of see how these things unfold, especially in this first preseason game. Not expecting a ton of run from any of these guys, but – am expecting when they are out there to see quite a bit of production and to see some good things. Now, a player we haven't seen a lot from, and you're probably not going to see a ton from, is wideout Jamison Williams. Now, it stinks because it's kind of been floated out there by NFL Network, and it's probably going to be the case that he's going to start the year on the pup list, which means basically forget about his first month of the year and look at probably the bye week as even the first consideration for him returning to the field. So he's taking everything in. He's there every single day, Jamison Williams, number 12 overall pick. But news was made on Wednesday. He posts on social media, on Instagram, a number nine jersey. And he is going to switch from 18 to number nine. And the reports are that he decided that it was in the best interest for himself and this respect to call Matthew Stafford and say, hey, I want your number. Is that okay? Now, you and I both in chatting probably think, why? What has Stafford really garnered? It's not retired, so it's open game. Why would you do that? And especially, I think, the part that is not needed is Stafford's not on the team anymore. If Stafford was the quarterback of the team, then you you, you make the call. You make the deal. You, you try and take his number. But for Jamison Williams to do that, maybe it's PR Maybe he wants to you know, leave the right impression, but I don't think he needed to do it in any kind of way. I, I, and I, I'm, I'm curious to get your reaction to the way in which he went about it. There are some people that are like, well, they don't want to see Jamison wearing number nine. So it's really a two-part question. Why would he call Stafford? And two, is it time to have the discussion then that maybe after Jamison... Maybe it's going to be interesting to see. Does he do enough to erase people's old memory of number nine? Should the Lions have just been like, you know what? Let's just make it so that nobody can wear number nine and it's retired because there's still strong report, uh, strong support for Matthew Stafford, despite what you and I may think about it. 
this dude called him. And many some fans online are just like, I don't want to see number nine being worn by anybody. I don't want to see number four being worn by anybody. I think it's a little bit strong of Jamison Williams to even make that move. Just take number nine and move on. Or if the organization wants to kind of make that number special, go ahead and do it. But I, I'm okay with him wearing it. I think he should just said, I want it. I'm the number 12 overall pick. Just take it. And not have to go through all this extra contacting Matthew Stafford, who's on the shelf with the bum elbow. Dude, when I heard this, I was like, what the fuck? Are you for real? You, you're, you're, you're calling the Rams quarterback? Not the Detroit Lions quarterback. You're calling the Rams quarterback and asking him to wear a number? This guy's no longer a Detroit Lion. Everybody needs to move the F on. Matt Stafford won you nothing. Matt Stafford did nothing for you here. Left maybe a couple of good memories in your mind, but probably left you with more frustrating memories than anything else. Matt Stafford's not your quarterback. He's not here. He went over to, he went over to L.A. They won a Super Bowl. Move on. Move on. There's no need to call him. I have no idea why this man would have to call this other man who's not part of this team and say, hey, can I wear number nine? Uh, I, honestly, I want to know if Matt Stafford was like, no. Would Jameson Williams be like, <laughs> uh, okay? Or he'd be like, all right, cool. I'm just going to wear it anyways. I really wish Matt Stafford would have been like, no. And he would have just been like, all right, bet. I'm just going to wear that anyways. You can go kick rocks. I really wish – Somebody from this organization would put Matt Stafford in his place. Like, bro, when you were here, you were the most average quarterback ever. Super average. Like, you weren't great. You're not some elite quarterback. You go to a team that is fully stocked and loaded. They basically gave you a ton of shit. And you know what? You're still not an elite quarterback. You're outside that. You're like that second tier. You're not tier one. You're tier two. You're a tier two quarterback. Cool, you elevated yourself. So instead of being at the very bottom of tier two here, now you're at the very top of tier two there. Go kick rocks, bro. You're nothing special. You're not. There's nothing special about you. Why does this organization constantly hitch its wagon to Matt Stafford? He is nothing to you anymore. Move on, people. And if you're one of those tool bags who are like, oh, my God, Matt Stafford. I love Matt Stafford. Matt Stafford's the greatest cornerback ever. Matt Stafford's a great Lions cornerback. He's going to be remembered for that way. And you drool and you suckle at the teat of Matt Stafford. You, too, can go kick rocks and go jump off a bridge. There's no need for this wide receiver to call that quarterback and say, hey, can I wear your old number? What the hell does it matter? He's no, not part of this team. No, no. Keep it moving, boys. No, let's be real. Do you think he on his own did that? Or was he told, hey, I, I want to wear number nine. And, and collectively, like, he goes, should I call Matthew? And they're like, oh, yeah, we got him on speed dial. So oh, yeah, I <laughs> bet I bet it was the organization, yeah. which, is, which is the biggest indictment of this organization. Yeah, I, yeah. This organization still hitching itself to him. Yeah, just Move take the, the fuck on. I don't take the number. Why you got to ask? Exactly. Dude, do you, does everybody forget the part where... Matthew tapped out. Could you imagine a rebuild with Matthew Stafford, DJ Chark, Amonra, St. Brown, and all these people? I mean, if you really thought about it and you had this opportunity, I know that you, you used that extra pick to get Jamison Williams, but you could have had Stafford and Amonra, St. Brown. You know, you could have had Stafford uh, with the likes of a rebuilt offensive line. Could you imagine Stafford going into this year with this talent? Uh, minus Jamison Williams, and you just added one more talented wideout. So you got to remember, guys, he walked in and said, I'm out, no moss, no more, I want out. And he basically helped in the process of your rebuild, but in the end, you didn't get really proven talent. You got a quarterback that many think has peaked. You haven't gotten somebody that's like absolutely somebody that – is out there and doing the greatest of things. There's a lot of potential, a lot of good potential. It's still a very valuable trade to get a couple first-rounders, but it's predicated on hitting. So, yeah, absolutely, you and I are in agreement that far too much reverence is given to a player that never won a single playoff game. Good Lord. And then went out and then had all the success of his football career, not with you. So, please, I think you and I are in the same boat. But I think it's cool. Jameson Williams, number nine. I would have rather have seen him in 18 or, or one, but Okuda and uh, 18 was not to be. He wanted to be more comfortable, so he'll be in single digits. And uh, you won't see him for a couple weeks, so you'll still have a couple time to still revere the number nine 
with the Detroit Lions. So good talk about, you know, football, good football conversation, 45 minutes before and now the preseason hits this Friday. A lot of good stuff for us to check out. A lot of good things ahead with hard knocks. And as we continue to evaluate training camp and all the good news on one side of the football and the development of some young talent on the other. So it's going to be a fun time. So stay tuned to the Detroit Sports Podcast Network as we cover all things in Detroit sports. So you and I came across one nugget of information that really scared the shit out of us. So very much the hot topic around Chris Illich involves obviously the plight of the Tigers and the way they've struggled. Well, another aspect that has really added to the fuel that Chris Illich doesn't care has been the fact that he used, you know, public dollars for the development of LCA with the promise of some great, you know, LED lights and a great lighted roof at LCA. We should have known something was up. You remember that rendering with the cool Red Wings logo and it's going to light up the sky all red? And then what we got was nothing like that. We got a little Caesars logo. That bro, should... I fly over that thing every morning yeah, in the yeah. helicopter. Bro, and you know how, how it, much it, it is gross. It is like dingy. It is yeah. dirty, and it is it 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 just looks stupid. So it doesn't light up. You remember the rendering? How excited we yep. got? We're like, dude, we're yep. gonna have the coolest shit ever. It's gonna be sweet. Yep. And that's not what we got. And that's kind of called bait and switch. Well, part of the reason. That maybe some action has been taken allegedly. Everything we're talking about is allegedly. There was a suspicious fire for a home that was directly near LCA that's been holding up potential development because the Illiches have offered hundreds of thousands of dollars for this property. The owner reportedly has been asking three, four million dollars and won't move. Many have said to the Illiches, just dude, you're, you're billionaire, just pay the man whatever he wants and keep it moving. Now, the funny part is when, when me, Kenny, and my wife parked at AEW, there's a parking lot right next door, but it was for passes only. So we par- literally the DSP curse hit that that home. We par- we went into the parking lot directly next to the home, had to swing out because it wasn't an open parking lot. So I had to swing back out into traffic uh, against the grain and get back into the side where we could get into parking. So we see- I seen it. So when I saw that that home suspiciously burnt to the ground in like five minutes and with the swirling news that people are not happy with District Detroit, maybe the Illiches wanted this property. I have a hard time finding um, the ability to believe that something nefarious took place. But boy, when that hit the news that that home burnt to the ground, the first people, the first thing that people thought was, oh, the Illich has something to do with it, allegedly. So I think it's suspicious, but I'm not saying that I'm really concerned um, regarding that. But all I'm going to say is we owe, here at the DSP Network apologize for anything negative we've said about Chris Illich. We hold him to be in high regards, and we don't want anything to happen to the fine city of Sterling Heights or our fine broadcast studio or anything affiliated with DSP. So all of the negative Tiger tweets and memes we apologize for, and we just want to say that uh, Chris Illich, we think that uh, for the time being, um, while you're maybe in this mood, we uh, hold you to be one of the uh, premier owners in all of sports, and uh, thank you for your philanthropy, and uh, just please, um, you know, please hold the Detroit Sports Podcast in your highest regard as you decide in your future endeavors what you're into. Suspicious, but that's crazy timing, right, cuz? I thought it was incredibly interesting. <laughs> this has been the one thing that has held up a lot of different things and really has brought down some of the value in that area because that house looks absolutely disgusting. Scorched. Or it looked like it was disgusting. Yeah. It's now ashes. But it, to me, it was weird because they could never come to an agreement on on the sale of that property. At, at one point, it was listed for $2 million. <laughs> and, and honestly, the house wasn't worth, I think, maybe ten grand. <laughs> So it, it's it's absolutely suspicious. That's the word I'll use. It, it is absolutely suspicious to see this finally after years and years and years of back and forth between Illich Holdings and whoever the owner of that property is to finally see this house burn down to the ground. It'll be interesting to see kind of what happens going forward. I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that there was a an insurance claim that'll be done and they'll get compensated. Uh, appropriately for that. But after that, what then happens? 
You know, does Illich then come in and, and buy that property, buy that that already burned down home? Or does that homeowner rebuild again and and again try to stick it to, to Chris Illich? Because it's really weird. It looks it looks so odd, doesn't it? You have all of this stuff for, for Little Caesars Arena, and right in the middle of it, you've got this basically gnarly ass green thumb that is just sticking out molding and it is gross and it is dilapidated and it's falling apart and then it gets burned to the ground super interesting yeah great. really really interesting when the news broke on that i was like huh and then i seen you you respond to a tweet and i was like he's thinking the same thing i'm thinking yeah. really really interesting real suspicious and i think the crazy part is you and i would naturally believe that okay if this house is there then you you, you bulldoze it it's not there and w- what's next i think that the the level of distrust between the fans and Chris Illich is at an all time high. In, in all seriousness, I don't even think they just would want it there just to kind of expand the parking lot, not to develop anything, not to develop a nice walkway or a restaurant path or anything. I don't see development taking place at least in the next three, four, five years. Everything that gets started is triple the cost, and it's not a situation that even seems like likely or feasible or doesn't have any good morale anymore. It's kind of like, well, bro, you told us this five years ago. Now you've waited. Now you're going to make us wait an extra decade for it. By that point, everybody will have their established hangouts. Are you really going to make it a priority to go to district Detroit uh, right next to little Caesars? I mean, there's so many great places you can go to around there. You can just go to little Caesars and handle your business. So it's just one of those things where you promised a lot, you overpromised and way underdelivered. LCA is nice, but surrounding it, there's no beautiful walkways. There's a bunch of parking lots. There's no, I mean, I personally don't even find that huge open area to be all that appealing. It just looks like a, a huge crowded space and with, with the big screen and some speakers and some lights. It, what's there? I mean, you, you don't even have enough like tables or you don't have anything cool. Get, you don't even have, if you go and walk there, it's a big open space with a screen. You don't even have chargers or gadgetries or electronic bike stands. You don't have anything cool there. It, it's just, let's just go stand here with a beer. And that's what it is. And listen to loud wrestling theme music when we go to LCA or uh, big, huge promos of the, ring, of the wings and all the PR that you do. So the stuff that you've done could be enhanced. So I'm, I'm in agreement with you that LCA... District Detroit, way over-promised, under-delivered, and Illich has a problem now, too, because the baseball team is struggling at an all-time clip. So it's a very interesting story, something that I do believe people will investigate continuously. So stay tuned to it. It's an ever-evolving story, but it does put into question, like, the timing, what the heck happened, what the end up, um, what the reasoning is for it, um, or... If we are way off base and the homeowner said, oh, I can't get to $2 million, nobody's going to give me nothing, then 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 maybe the, the owner allegedly could have said, shit, I'll just take the cash and keep it moving. You know, so potentially something allegedly could have gone wrong nefariously, but we'll see as the story evolves. But crazy times downtown, the DSP curse lives. We just went right by it uh, literally less than 45 days ago. And right after we pass it, it goes up in flames. What are you going to do? Great broadcast, sir. 55 minutes of Detroit sports content. We greatly appreciate it. If you've agreed or disagreed with anything that we've said, any review of Hard Knocks, hit us up at Detroit Podcast. Follow Adam on Twitter at Adam R-S-T-R-O-Z. And make sure you hit us up in regards to anything that you think about any of our content audio-wise with the fan report. Uh, Doc and Jock, our wrestling broadcast, uh, the fan report, open mic night, any of our interviews, our feature interviews, please let us know. We're always interested. Anywhere you listen to your favorite podcast, make sure that you hit Detroit Sports Podcast. And then to bring it full circle, at the beginning of Hard Knocks, there was a feature with Matt Derry who got on there that was talking about the up-downs. And they flashed it right on the screen, which is all which is all good collectively for us here on the internet. And it's the Lockdown Podcast Network from Matt Derry, who's been broadcasting well over five, six years daily about the Detroit Lions via the podcast platform. So podcaster at the beginning and podcaster at the end only goes to show you it's a, a reasonable medium to get yourself out there. 
And Adam and I have been going strong since 2013, and we're only just getting started, baby. More noise to make. And so for Adam the Jock Straczynski, I am the Doc John Macaroon. We're looking forward to next week where we can catch up again on Doc and Jock.